How's it going everyone? I'm Venom Mystere, and today's video isn't going to be your typical gameplay commentary or guide video. It's actually going to be part one of an ongoing series I'm starting, where I take a look at Billy Martin's book, his autobiography entitled Billy Ball. If you don't know who Billy Martin is, he's my favorite baseball manager ever. He was a star second baseman for the 1950s New York Yankees that were managed by Casey Stingle and won a ton of championships, widely considered to be one of the most impressive and infallible dynasties ever, the 1950s Yankees, the Empire of Gold. And then Billy Martin went on to become one of the most aggressive, talented managers ever. And there's no official audiobook release for his book Billy Ball or his book Number One. So what I'm going to be doing is we're going to be reading his book and then I'm also going to be adding in a little bit of commentary of my own. So it's not just going to be a straight up I'm reading the book, but I will be reading the book verbatim and then adding in my thoughts in addition to that. So let's go ahead and get started with part one. I'm going to start off with the little the little cover, whatever you call it, the little flap that's like the summary that you would usually find on the back of a book. And then I'm going to go from there. And this is all going to be one take. Usually audiobooks, they will just record someone and they'll sort of splice together the sentences so it sounds flawless. I'm just going to be one take in this bad boy. And I've had a couple, I've had a couple brews in true Billy Martin fashion. Billy loved to drink. He was a rabble rouser, a fighter and we're going to learn a bit about him. So this is Billy Ball by Billy Martin with Phil Pepe. Whether you love him or you hate him, and there's no in between, Billy Martin is always major league news, one of the most colorful and unquestionably one of the most controversial figures in the world of professional sports. Martin can always be counted on to speak his mind, loud and clear. Now in his insightful volume, the perennial on-again, off-again New York Yankees manager teams up with veteran Daily News columnist and author Phil Pepe to settle the score on the greatest love of his life, baseball. Billy Martin knows baseball as few others do, and his legendary genius and passion for the game are universally acknowledged. Here, in his own and admittable style, he gives us a winning lineup of inside information and heated opinion on just about everything that is baseball, from players, owners, and coaches, to strategy, the art of managing, and his own turbulent, lifelong affair with the sport. Billy's outspoken perspective offers a refreshingly singular slant on American's favorite national pastime. The perfect combination to, or the, excuse me, the perfect companion to number one Martin's best-selling autobiography, Billy Ball is a grand slam mix of plain sense and plenty of personality that swings for the, ben the bleachers and connects. A key player on the New York Yankee teams of the early 1950s, Billy Martin played for six other major league teams in his last five years before retiring from the infield in 1961. Since then, he has become one of the most recognized and admired managers in pro baseball. Phil Pepe has been at the forefront of pro sports for the last 20 years. He is the author of several sports books, blah, blah, blah. No one gives a fuck about Phil Pepe. So here's the dedication. This book is dedicated to two men who guided me, helped me, counseled me, and befriended me. Red Adams, trainer for the Oakland Oaks in the Pacific League, who helped me get my baseball career started, and Pete Shishi, clubhouse man for the Yanks, who helped me keep my baseball career going and helped me keep things in their proper perspective. So that was the intro. Here's chapter one. Why am I doing another book? That's a good question. I'll try to answer it. For one thing, it has been almost seven years since my last book was published, and obviously a lot has happened to me in seven years that you might want to get caught up on. For another, the emphasis of this book is somewhat different than the last one. I'm hoping this book can tell you more about Billy Martin the manager, in addition to Billy Martin the man. I would like this to be a kind of manual of managing, if you will, outlining my approach to managing, my technique as a manager, 
how I go about the job of managing a baseball team. The title Billy Ball comes from a slogan that was used by an Oakland sports writer, Ralph Wiley, to describe the style of play that my Oakland days were using in the 1981 season. There was nothing different about that style that I hadn't used in the four other cities I managed, good, hard, aggressive baseball, forcing the other team into making mistakes. Steal, hit and run, take the extra base. If Billy Ball is not if Billy Ball is not new or unique, it is uniquely Billy Martin. You can always identify a Billy Martin team by its aggressiveness. And as the title implies, the book is intended to tell you something about my style of baseball. Baseball is the greatest game ever invented, true. And one of the things that make it great is that it can be simple or as complex as you want it to be. Everybody and anybody with a television set or the price of a ticket can be an expert on baseball, or at least think he's an expert. It doesn't take a genius to know when to bunt, when to hit and run, when to bring in a new pitcher. That's the charm of baseball for an average fan. But things are not always that simple. No fan, or sports writer, or broadcaster, or scout, or general manager, or owner, or for that matter, knows as much about me on the field and the individuals who make up the team is the manager. Sometimes a move that seems so obvious to the fan in the stands or sitting in his living room is not that obvious to the manager. There are reasons he does certain things, or at least does not do certain things. The fan might think it's obvious that a manager should bring in his best relief pitcher in a certain situation. But what the fan might not know is that the relief pitcher, pitcher has pitched four consecutive days or warmed up five or six days in a row and has told the manager before the game that his arm is tired. The manager knows he can't use his relief pitcher. Let's say it's Dave Rigetti, who is an incredibly talented New York Yankees pitcher, by the way. But he's not going to tell you, but he's not going to tell the press Rigetti is unavailable because he doesn't want the other manager to find out. Let the other manager think he might have to face Rigetti. It might force him to make a move he does not otherwise make. There are other things I will discuss in the pages that follow, such as why I hit and run on a certain count against a certain pitcher with a certain hitter. Every move I make as a manager has a reason, just as there is a reason for every move I don't make. Baseball has been my life. It's the thing I know best and the thing I have done best. I have been a major league player, not a Hall of Famer, but a pretty successful player, especially in World Series competition. And I have been a successful manager. I think I have something I can share with the fans, my knowledge of the game. Things don't just happen by accident on the field. They usually happen for a reason. I feel I have prepared for my job of managing with the most thorough education I could get. Nothing ever came easy for me as a player. I had limited ability limited ability and I had to do the little things to make myself a more valuable player. Those little things that make the difference between winning and losing. And it was this determination to make myself a better and more valuable player that taught me so much about the game. As a second baseman I feel I had an advantage for my future career of manager. Middle infielders, shortstops and second basemen, usually make the best managers because they are more involved in the game in more ways than players at any other positions. I have managed in the minor leagues, which I feel is essential, and I have coached third base and scouted. I have had a well-rounded baseball education, and I have had some great teachers. We're all the products of our experience, and the experience of playing for such an outstanding manager like Casey Stingle, Charlie Dresden and Freddie Hutchinson has really helped me become a successful manager. There is more to managing than filling out a lineup card and bringing in a new pitcher. Their relationship with the players, front office relationships, evaluating talent, knowing the human nature, knowing when to push a team and when to back off. All of these facets will be discussed in the following pages. To what do I attribute my success as a manager? so many things. My training for one. Also, I am a stickler for detail. I come to a game well prepared to do my job. I try to steal, I try to stay two or three batters, sometimes two or three innings ahead. If it's the fourth inning, I might be thinking of a move I can make in the seventh inning. Gidry looks like he hasn't had 
Sorry. Gidry looks like he hasn't have good stuff. I'd better get my bullpen ready. Weaver, Baltimore Orioles manager and rival to Billy Martin, Earl Weaver, has already used two of his right-handed hitters to pinch hit, trying to get back in the game. I'll get another left-handed pitcher ready because there aren't as many moves Weaver can make. I drive my players and my coaches hard, especially in spring training. I want them to do things over and over so that they become automatic. It has been said that a good manager can win anywhere from 8 to 12 games a year for his team. That might not seem like much, but when you consider that most pennants are won by from 3 to 8 games, a manager can make the Hall of Fame if he can win 8 or 12 games a year for his team. In this book, I intend to discuss managerial strategy to give you an idea how Billy Martin thinks, how he goes about his business of managing a baseball team. I will grade other managers. I'll discuss front office relationship and owners I've worked for. I'll talk about the state of the game, what I see as baseball's major problems, and what suggestions I have to solve those problems. I'll talk about the people I've met and the friends I've made. And I'll present Billy Martin's All-Stars, made up of players I have played with and against, managed and managed against. Baseball has been in my life for 40 years. It's the only job I have ever had. I have done what I have wanted to do with my life, and in that respect, I consider myself very fortunate, and I consider my life a success. This does not mean I have been perfect or that my life has been perfect. There are some things I would change if I could. I regret that I have not lived a stable and secure existence. I left home when I was 18 to play baseball and I never really had a permanent home since then. I regret that. I have had three marriages that failed and I regret that too. I'm not going to get into why those marriages failed or who was at fault. I am willing to accept my share of the blame for those failures. I regret, too, that I didn't spend as much time with my family and with my two children as I would have liked. I regret that, but I'm not apologizing for it. I made my bed and I'll sleep in it. I went to be a baseball player for as far back as I can remember. Then, once I started managing, I was bitten by the bug and I wanted to be the best manager I could be. I played for the New York Yankees and I managed the New York Yankees. And that's like a baritone singing for La Scala or an artist having one of his paintings hanging in the Lavore. Being a, manage, being a player and a manager for the New York Yankees, the greatest team in sports, has been a thrill and a privilege that I will never regret, even though it didn't always turn out the way I hoped it would. Nevertheless, I did the things I wanted to do, and I did them to the best of my ability, and for that there are no regrets and no apologies. Even with all the sacrifices I have made, all the things I have had to miss, all the owners who have fired me, it's been a great life. Very few people get to work at a job they love, and I'm one of them. You want to talk about pride? Let me tell you about the day, Sunday, August 10th, 1986, Billy Martin Day at Yankee Stadium, a day I'll never forget. It was the greatest day of my life. Nothing will ever top it. Nothing possibly could. It wasn't just because they retired my number one, or because they dedicated a plaque to me which will stand next to the monuments in center field, right next to Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, Casey Stingel, Mickey Mantle, and other Giants greats. It wasn't because of all the wonderful gifts I received from so many thoughtful people. No, what made this day special was the love and warmth I felt coming down from the stands. And what made it extra special was that my mother was there to witness it all. We were standing there, lined up at home plate, when they introduced her and wheeled her out to join us. She was in a wheelchair because she was th because three months earlier she fell and broke her hip. I was afraid that would prevent her from coming, but she made that long plane trip all the way to New York from Berkeley. She had never seen Yankee Stadium before, and I was proud of her for being there. She was wearing her Yankee cap and a Yankee pinstripe dress that she had made especially for the occasion. They wheeled her to my side, and as I bent over to give her a kiss, she looked up and said, I look pretty good for an old broad, don't I, Billy? I thought she looked beautiful. She's a tough old bird, my mom. She's 86, and she's still so full of life, it's unbelievable. 
Her language tends to get a little salty every once in a while, especially when she talks on her CB. If you're ever in San Francisco, if you're ever in the San Francisco Oakland area, and you have a CB and you make contact with my mother, another C beer called Yankee One, that's my mom. But now, she was here to be part of the festivities while they retire my number. My two half sisters, Joan and Patsy, were there, and my two half brothers, Jack and Frank. My daughter, Kelly Ann, was there with my two granddaughters, Evie and Sonia. And my son, Billy Joe, was there. He's a student at Texas Tech University, and I'm proud of him because I never had the opportunity to go to college. In fact, Billy Joe is the first member of my family to attend college. I have been on the field at Yankee Stadium thousands of times, but standing there at home plate on this day was different. Suddenly, the stadium seemed so much bigger than it ever had before. The stands were almost full, and it's eerie it's an eerie feeling to hear the echo from the loudspeaker the words just seeming to bounce back at you from the stands bill white the former great st louis broadcast the former st louis cardinals first baseman and for years a broadcaster for the yankees conducted the ceremonies and i listened intently as he read what had been engraved on my plaque the words reverberating throughout the huge stadium Alfred Manuel Billy Martin, Casey's boy. A Yankee forever. A man who knew only one way to play. To win. As a player for Casey Stengel, he thrived on pressure, delivering the key player hit. MVP of the 1953 World Series, setting a record for most hits in a six-game series with 12. Later as a manager, he became one of the greatest Yankee managers erected by the New York Yankees, August 10, 1986. There were telegrams from Joe DiMaggio and Bobby Richardson, among others. Ron Luciano, the former American League umpire, made a funny presentation. Brad Corbett, the owner in Texas when I was there, and one of, the, <laughs> and one of those who fired me, was there with a gift. My buddies Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford spoke. Ron Guidry presented me with a beautiful number one diamond and gold pendant on behalf of the New York Yankees I had managed. It was George Steinbrenner who made this day possible. He promised me three years earlier he was going to give me this day. I never mentioned it to him and I thought he had forgotten about it, but he kept his word, and for that, I'm grateful. Many of my friends and family, my former teammates, players and coaches, and opponents came from all over the country to be there that day. But what really made this day possible was the fans, and to describe what I felt coming down from the stands would be impossible. As I stood there, waiting for the ceremony to end, my knees felt like jello. I am an emotional man, and this was almost too much to bear. I kept thinking that only twelve other Yankees had had their numbers retired, and how privileged I felt to be joining them. Babe Ruth, number three, Lou Gehrig, number four, Joe DiMaggio, number five, Mickey Mantle, number seven, Bill Dickey and Yogi Berra, number eight, Roger Maris, number nine, Phil Rizzuto, number ten, Thurman Munson, number fifteen, Whitey Ford, number sixteen, Elston Howard, number thirty-two, and of course, the man who means the most to me, Casey Stingle, number thirty-seven, and now, a little Dago kid from Berkeley who was considered too small and not talented enough to make it. It was my turn to speak, and I, d and I just didn't know how I was going to get through my speech without breaking down. I didn't. Quote, The four most important things in my life, I said, have been family, God, my friends, and being a Yankee. I want to thank all the coaches who helped me in the past, all the players who made it possible, and you fans, who are the best in the world, who stuck behind me. I may not have been the greatest Yankee ever put on the uniform, but I am the proudest. And that's just about as far as I could get. I wanted to say thank you, Casey Stengel, but I couldn't get it out. I did remember to send flowers to Casey's grave in Glendale, California. With the flowers, I sent a message that said, quote, I love you and owe you everything. This was Casey Stengel's day, too, and it was my mom's day. I had meant to mention Bobby Richardson, and I forgot that, too, but I did send him a letter. 
Bobby succeeded me as the Yankee second baseman and also wore the uniform number one. I wanted Bobby to know that even though they are retiring number one for me, he is as much entitled to wear the number as I am as I am because of all the honors he received and the dignity he brought to that old uniform while wearing it. So if you go to Yankees old timer game and you see Richardson wearing the number one on the back of his uniform, you'll understand why. That night, the Sheraton Heights Hotel in Hasbach Heights, New Jersey, my day continued at a party given in my honor. The big ballroom was overflowing with my family and friends. This was all the idea of my fiance, Jill Giver, and what a tremendous job she did. Jill spent hours and hours making all the arrangements and did almost everything herself with the support of my attorney, Judge Eddie Sapir of New Orleans and his associate, Paul Tabary. Jill assembled the guest list, had the invitations printed, contacted people by telephone. She arranged for the food, the music, the flowers, the liquor. There were people there from all over the country, family and friends and colleagues, some people I hadn't seen since grammar school. Tom Dresden, the comedian, a good friend and a very funny man, flew out all the way from Hawaii to serve as a master of ceremonies, and he was sensational as always. Tom brought with him a tape message from Tom Selleck and one from the chairman of the board himself, Frank Sinatra. Quote, I'm the only man in your lifetime who has been in more saloon fights than you, Frank said. Billy, you know I love you and have for many, many years. Ken Kaser, the American League umpire, spoke, and what touched me was that he had asked the league to switch his assignment from Texas to New York for that day so he could be there. An umpire! Can you believe it? Jimmy Pearsall was there, and he said a few words. I once had a knockdown, drag-out fight under the stands with Jimmy when we were both players. Today he is a good friend. A few years ago, when Pearsall needed a job, I hired him in Texas to do public relations work. Now he was saying, in front of a ballroom filled with people, If you ever need me, Billy... Just call, and I'll be there. Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford spoke again. Diana Munson, Thurman's wife, was there with her three children. My old coaches, Art Fowler and Cleet Boyer, were there. Art came from South Carolina and Cleet from Atlanta. Mickey Marabito, who helped me so much at public relations director for both the Yankees and the A's, came in from Oakland. Lee McPhail, the former president of the American League, was there. So were Sweet Lou Pinella and several of his players, Ron Guidry, Joe Necro, Brian Fisher, Dave Rigetti, and Tommy John. Jackie Moore, who coached for me in Oakland, was there. So many old Yankee teammates, Joe Collins. So were Yankee teammates, Joe Collins and Charlie Silvera. And Walt Droppo, who was my teammate in Cincinnati in 1960. Once again, it was my turn to talk. I wasn't as nervous this time, although I talked without a prepared speech or notes. No question, this is the greatest day of my life, I told the people, and I meant it. What is Billy Martin, I asked. It's you. It's, it's you. You're what it's all about, my friends, my family. People came here from all over the United States. That makes me proud. I came from Berkeley, and people said I was too small to play in the big leagues. They said I couldn't adjust to the big city. I've been up and down, and what it boils down to is that the good Lord has taken care of me. How do you say thanks? There's no real way. If you have a child that wants to be a major leaguer, God can't give you any more than that. God bless you. I really love you all. Earlier in the day, at a press conference after the ceremonies at Yankee Stadium, one of the writers asked me what I thought was the reason for my appeal with the fans. I told the writers I thought the people related to me because I'm a piece of every one of them. I have always managed aggressively and they like that. And they like the fact that I told my bosses what they can do with their jobs and I've stood up to my bosses. And I think every working man would like to do that. He would like to stand up to his boss, to tell his boss to take his job and stick it. I always fought for what I thought was right and that's the point of the average and that's why the average guy relates to me. To prove a point, one night one of the nicest things that happened to me at the party was the members of the New York City Police Department 
detail that works at Yankee Stadium presented me with the gift. They know of my interest in the Civil War and they gave me an original photograph of General Sheridan. That thrilled me because these are not just hard-working guys, certainly not millionaires, and they were kind enough to, and considerate enough to do something for me. I don't know how to thank them. To me, these guys represent the average fans who have always been my biggest supporters. The writers, the writers also asked me about the possibility of managing the Yankees again. I told them I'm, I'm not coming back again as the manager of the Yankees. Look, I don't know what's going to happen. I can't read the future. I do know that I meant it when I said it at the time, and I think the reason I felt the way that way is this. To wear that uniform was an awfully proud thing. To think of the people that wore it, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, and to have your plaque up there with theirs, well, that's something special. They talk about the pride of the Yankees. I know it because it has always been in me. Even when I was on other teams, I still considered myself a Yankee. Then when I brought back when I was brought back as manager of the Yankees, that was topped that just topped everything off. It was my dream come true. I wanted to manage the Yankees so badly. I loved that job so much. And as with anything that you love so much, it hurts even more when you lose it. Maybe I said I'd never manage the Yankees again because I don't want to go through the pain of losing that job again. Tommy Lasorda says that when he dies and goes to heaven, he'll find the Lord wearing Dodger blue. Tommy Lasorda is wrong. When he dies and goes to heaven, he'll find the Lord wearing Yankee pinstripes. Thus concludes chapter 1. So a few things that I'd like to say before I conclude the video. Billy Martin was hired and fired from the Yankees like five different times. He would manage the team for a year, do well, and then he would get into a fight or have some sort of altercation or say something about the owner, George Steinbrenner, and then he would get canned. And then George Steinbrenner, the next year, whenever he was tired of losing, would bring Billy back. He knew how much winning meant to Billy. And he knew how much Billy wanted the job. And he was a very aggressive manager. And he was a very talented guy. And we're going to learn more about that in the following chapters. So subscribe for more so you don't miss any of the following chapters.